We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the, to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water, come, to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed in Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Ah, oh, you got an extra three verses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If we look back in Matthew's Gospel just a little bit, in chapter 13, we see that Jesus was busy teaching the disciples, mostly in parables, and a large crowd was following him. We looked at a couple of those parables a couple of weeks ago. Then Jesus returned to his hometown, where the people rejected his teaching. Chapter 13 in Matthew ends by telling us, in uh, verses 57 through 58. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and his, and his own home. And he did not do many miracles, any, many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Chapter 14 opens with the death of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And when our scripture reading today starts by telling us, it says when Jesus heard what had happened, this is what the scripture is referring to. That Jesus had been rejected in his hometown, and his cousin had been killed by King Herod. He realizes that he is one year away from the cross, and I believe at this time Jesus' heart was probably feeling pretty heavy. And we see that people from all over are bringing their sick to Jesus, hoping for a miraculous he healing. Because of these miraculous healings, Jesus' popularity with the people was as high as it would ever be. Even King Herod knew of this miraculous healer. And when Herod heard about Jesus, he thought maybe he was John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Maybe to come back and haunt him because he had put him to death unjustly. Jesus may have been feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, and filled with human emotions as he sought a little time alone. Remember that Jesus was fully human, and feeling human pain and emotions, as well as fully divine. So Jesus wanted a little quiet time away from the crowds. So he went with his disciples by boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to a remote place. But when the crowd saw the great healer go, they followed him. The Sea of Galilee is about 8 miles wide and about 13 miles long. 
So on a clear day, people on the shore could see to the other side. And they would have been able to see Jesus in a boat crossing the lake. And they were able to follow him on foot around the northern edge of the sea to where he was. So the crowd caught up with Jesus on the far side of the sea. And even though he sought rest in a solitary place, Jesus had compassion on the large crowd that had followed him. And we see that Jesus went ahead and he healed the sick in the crowd. And the day wore on and as evening approached, the disciples recommended Jesus to send the crowd away, that they may go get something to eat, leading to what may be one of the most popular miracles that Jesus performed. The feeding of the 5,000 men, along with their wives and children, is the only miracle besides the resurrection itself that's found in all four Gospels. It's quite possible that nearly 20,000 people were fed in all. And when the disciples tell Jesus to send the crowds home to get something to eat, he tells them in verse 16, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Why would Jesus tell the disciples to give the crowd something to eat? Twelve disciples with no food? Twenty thousand hungry people? Sounds somewhat ridiculous, doesn't it? Jesus knows that they have no food and no resources to feed this many people. There's no restaurants, no Walmart ne nearby. So why does Jesus tell the disciples to feed the crowd when he knows that they lack the supplies to do so? It's easy for us to overlook this little statement in the scripture reading, but I think it's important. In scripture and in our lives, God often commands us to do the impossible. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 Peter writes, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. We're all as holy as Jesus, right? Romans 12, 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We all do that. Matthew 5, 44, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Of course, Luke 6, 27 and 28, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Does Jesus honestly expect us to do all this? All the time? To be as holy as God is holy? To bless and to pray for our persecutors? To love our enemies? To do good? to bless and to pray for all those who oppose us. But that's what scripture tells us to do, right? Just as Jesus instructed the disciples to do the impossible, we are also told to do the impossible. And we can look at how the disciples responded to see how we can do the impossible that God requires of us. So the disciples go among the crowd and they find a boy who brought a lunch. Peter speaks up and in John 6, 9 we read, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? The disciples gathered up what they could and they gave it to Jesus. I believe that they gave the food to Jesus to show how futile it would be for them to try to feed the crowd because they were looking at the situation through human eyes. They weren't looking at it through the power of God who can do all things. We can't in our own strength, but through the power of God living within us, if it's God's will, His will will be accomplished. That's how we can do the impossible and do what God requires of us. By gathering up all we can and giving it to God. Philippians 4.13 I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Not by our strength, but through God's strength. 
And in verse 18, Jesus tells the disciples to bring the fish and the loaves to him. If we want Jesus to use what we have and to work through it, we have to surrender all that we have to him and let him do his will with our lives, our gifts, and our possessions. Whatever we are and whatever we have, it's all a gift from God anyway. And God won't use it until we surrender it to him. Then we see that Jesus took the food, he gave thanks, broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples. That sounds a little bit like what we'll be reading a little bit in our communion liturgy, doesn't it? We see Jesus' provision was more than enough. Everyone ate and was filled, and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Philippians 4.19, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in, in glory in Christ Jesus. And at this time, Jesus realizes that the crowd is ready to make him their king by force. We can see that in John 6, 14 and 15. It tells us, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The crowd was with Jesus because they wanted a free meal, not because they recognized Jesus as the Messiah. They felt that if they forced Jesus to be their leader, they could enjoy his miracles for all time. The next day, John tells us that the followers questioned Jesus. John 6, 30. The followers asked Jesus, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Well, evidently, they haven't been paying too much attention when Jesus was doing all the healings and the feeding that Jesus had just done for them. No matter what Jesus did, it would not be enough to convince the, the crowds who had hardened their hearts that he truly was the Messiah. What Jesus wanted the people to receive wasn't a free lunch, but a free relationship with God. But that's not what they wanted. So the crowd turned on him, and many left Jesus at this time. He told them that he was the bread of life. But they didn't want the bread of life. They wanted a free fish sandwich. So many of the closed-minded people left Jesus. Jesus' followers shrunk that day from thousands to a handful. John 6, 66. The only chapter 6, verse 66 in the Bible. Tells us from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In our scripture reading today, we see another very popular miracle that Jesus performed. After Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go back across the sea, he goes away by himself to pray. And predictably, a storm hits. Now on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee is Mount Hermon, which rises 7,200 feet above the sea. That's a little more than a mile and a quarter straight up. It's snow-capped and very cold at the top of the mountain. When the sun sets on the sea and the temperature begins to drop, the northern wind blows across the mountains and the wind becomes very cold. And then that cold wind blows across the warm water and you've got the perfect recipe for a, for a thunderstorm. Big storms would often blow up on the Sea of Galilee in the evening. It's a very dangerous place for people to be on a boat in the evening when the sun would set. They came, the storms came in suddenly and they were very extreme. But the disciples knew this. They were fishermen. They made their livings, their entire life was spent on the Sea of Galilee fishing. They knew that this was a bad time to be on the sea. So why did they go? Our scripture reading tells us that uh, Jesus told them to go. He forced them to go. It wasn't a suggestion or a recommendation. 
Jesus ordered them to go. So they went because Jesus told them to. And the all-knowing Christ would have known that a storm was coming. So why would Jesus deliberately send his disciples out into this dangerous situation? Any of y'all ever wondered that? When we're faithful to follow as God leads, we need to realize that this does not mean that we will be insulated from the storms of life. The disciples were faithful and they were obedient to Jesus' command. And they were beaten senseless by a storm because of it. God doesn't promise an easy life to his followers. Do we feel like everything should be easy in our lives if we're following God's will? Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 verses 23 and 24, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. To deny ourselves and take up our cross for Jesus, that doesn't sound like a rosy life, does it? And it's not intended to. But as we see in the storm, Jesus comes to the disciples and he saves them. When the disciples welcomed Jesus into the boat, immediately the wind stopped. And John tells us in his account of the story in 621, then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. When they invited Jesus into the problem, they were delivered from it. The storm battered and beat the experienced fishermen, but Jesus was in the storm, and he rescued them. And we read in verse 33 that those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's important to note here that this is the first time recorded in Scripture that the disciples refer to Jesus as the Son of God. I believe that the whole purpose of that miracle and the reason that Jesus sent the disciples out into the storm was so that they would finally realize without any doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. God said, get in the boat and go to the other side. Even though he knew the storm was coming and the disciples knew that it was dangerous to be on the sea at that time. The word of God led them straight into the teeth of the storm. But God was with them and outlasted the storm. And when they reached the shore, they proclaimed for the first time that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Remember that even in the storms of life, Jesus is with us, that he loves us, and even when we don't see it, he's working for our good. When the storm comes, and it will, Stand fast in God's word. We will eventually all be led home to safety. Take the meager provisions that we have and surrender them all to the Lord, and he will provide, and he will get us through to the other side, to the safe shore. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that as we look to your word, we can see the people that you used and your disciples, that they're real, and they remind us so much of ourselves and our walk with you. Bless us that we may see with your eyes, to see the world as you see it. When the world seems out of control and the storms batter us, help us to remember that you know the future and that you are for us. Assure us as we navigate the storms that your word will outlast the storm. Fill our hearts with faith and give us the courage to surrender everything to you so that you may use it to bless us and to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.